Yeah, good evening everybody. I uh, hope that everybody's warm enough. Uh, today I'm going to talk about confusion and how uh, failure, confusion and mistakes, how they are uh, nowadays essential in the creative process. I mean, we live in a world, especially in the creative world, where everything's, everything is going towards perfection. And uh, I think in uh, creativity, you need to disrupt that by deliberately go towards uh, failure and towards uh, uh, something like a mistake. So not learning for your, from your mistake, but just going towards a mistake. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about that and uh, hopefully uh, you will uh, learn a little bit from that. And uh, I do that also uh, through showing some work of uh, the office, uh, Kessels Kramer, and um, uh, also some uh, personal work that I make. So uh, throughout different uh, disciplines that I, that I uh, use. I think first of all it's very important to uh, make an idiot out of yourself. Look at yourself now. I mean, uh, it's like ridiculous. At least you have to do that once a day, so that's now. So, uh, I mean, uh, I also did this already in an early stage of my career because uh, our first job, uh, Johan, and Kramer, Johan Kramer and I had, was in an office and one time we showed up uh, in a, on a meeting in two uh, chicken suits. So that didn't last for very long because we got kicked off of the, out of the office. But I have to thank uh, Narish is also in the audience here. Uh, he was the one who decided maybe it's good to not stay with us, but you have to do that yourself. So we, uh, I have to thank him for that because it was a big inspiration, these two uh, chicken suits. Because then we started our own agency and we, got, uh, another, we made another idiot out of ourselves. And uh, this was our first company picture. So uh, that, uh, there you go. Um, uh, we, have, we work in an office in Amsterdam, which is a former church. Uh, it's very nice to work in a church because you can tell to your mother that you go to church every day. I mean, also recently we have an office in uh, London, which is a shop, a gallery and a workspace in one. I mean, uh, every six weeks we do an exhibition there. Uh, there's a lot of people always, 150, 200 people. I was surprised that at every six weeks there are so many people, but uh, it turned out that when the free beer was finished, it was totally empty. So. <laughs> I mean, uh, that shows it all. And um, I think uh, to just show some examples of uh, work that we did, which is very important, I think, for creative work, uh, when, when, when nobody uh, hates it, nobody loves it. I mean, don't think that when people uh, hate it, uh, that it's not good. I mean, it turns out that I, I at least uh, think that when a lot of people hated uh, some of the projects I did, in the end, uh, they were uh, very good. This was uh, very early work uh, from, for a shoe store in Amsterdam where we used uh, young handicapped people to star in these ads. We worked for many years for Diesel also, the uh, jeans company. This is uh, an, an ad where we showed that uh, people nowadays want to stay younger and younger constantly. So uh, we just gave them tips for, to do that. This is, uh, for instance, by drinking urine, you will stay quite young. And this is like the motto for the uh, city of Amsterdam uh, that we did, uh, called I Amsterdam. Also something where what people hated in the beginning quite a lot. There was a lot of controversy about this, but uh, in the end it's now uh, quite uh, successful. Another uh, company, a platform we work for is uh, called uh, Women Inc. It is a platform for women and for their rights. And this is for instance a campaign where, because it turns out that women in their working life uh, earn 300,000 euro less than men still. So this campaign is showing uh, that these women, they are looking for their 300,000 uh, euro and finding it on their work. And uh, this is a campaign for a mobile phone uh, company we did. Uh, but also, I work already for a long time in advertising, but uh, I really hate advertising, to be honest. And I think uh, most of you hate advertising because it's dreadful uh, a lot. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Advertising is full of stereotypes and images are polished, uh, often it's not the reality and, and advertising is lying also often. But in advertising you can be also very successful and uh, I mean in this case we uh, worked for a mobile phone company and uh, we showed kind of imagery and, and uh, text that was also not very uh, stereotypical. So uh, Ben is the name of the company, it means I am. And uh, here it says like, uh, I am still here, ik ben er nog. And uh, Ben welcome means uh, I am welcome, which deals with uh, migration issues also in, uh, in Holland. 
And uh, next I show one uh, uh, commercial that we did for this uh, mobile phone company, which also touches on a social issue, because uh, often when people are on the phone, they don't have an eye for what is going on around them anymore. So this is a very serious uh, social issue that we touched on this uh, commercial. These are uh, ads for uh, the Standard Hotel, where you can find anything but standard uh, things. So uh, this is some uh, examples of uh, that. And the next uh, one I show a commercial uh, that was done uh, during the World Cup of uh, soccer. This was for a radio station. And many times you see also that during uh, soccer, all the TV commercials are exactly the same. They deal with the color of the national team. They, uh, they just uh, show all the standard things. So we just tried to change that a little bit for this uh, radio station. Yeah, the uh, animal rights organization, they were not very happy uh, with us. Uh, so they, uh, which was brilliant in a way, because they demanded that, I had to make a, that we had to make another uh, spot to show that the dog was still alive. So uh, that was a blessing, of course. So uh, the next event that was up, uh, that was important for them, was the Tour de France. So we decided to, to let the same guy with the dog come back into the spot again. Yeah, we, uh, we never heard from them back anymore after this uh, spot, so uh, that was the end of the relationship with the Animal Rights Organization. Okay, um, another thing uh, very recent, it's just like a month old, uh, is an identity that we did for a museum in Dusseldorf. And it's quite nice, uh, like when you do identities for musea, it's, it's, I mean, normally they're also very static. In musea there's always a lot happening, but that's not often reflected in the identity. So what we did, we just took a blank canvas that uh, you, where, where everybody starts also before going into a museum. And we made that graphic. Uh, the museum is called NOA Forum Dusseldorf. Not a very easy name, but uh, so uh, that name has a lot of canvases. And we put all kinds of different typefaces in them so they could change uh, constantly their uh, identity. So that's, that's what you see here. That's constantly changing. And it also means that in the poses that they make, uh, it can uh, yeah, t totally change its, uh, its view. This is like an exhibition they have at the moment, and um, also in and around the museum we uh, did things. So, for instance, this was outside where normally people were smoking. This is saying uh, space to dance. It's a German museum. And uh, this is like the hug zone, so it's on a little tile. Or uh, this is a space for discussion, room for discussion. And uh, in the museum itself, everybody has a sweater on, but we mix them totally. So the, the, the director of the museum has a sweater with security on there. The curator has a shop manager uh, sweater on, so that's constantly switched. And in the museum, you have these benches where you can sit on. So there, we have also text on there saying normal, uh, different, uh, better. Or uh, this one says uh, father, mother, uh, child, uh, animal friend. And uh, also this one says corner, it's just somewhere in the museum uh, pointing at a corner. Or uh, this is like the, the locker area, so it says mini bar, uh, bad mood, you can uh, lock up your bad moods there. And this is the uh, wardrobe and it says also uh, please no trousers because you need to keep them on. And um, yeah, this is like a masterpiece, just random in the museum. 
And uh, when you get in, you can put your umbrella somewhere, but there's also one of the umbrella stands which asks you to donate money. So uh, here there's a room for rent. Uh, that, that's uh, like the, the fire hose. And uh, the disco, of course, uh, that's the security system. And uh, it's just a language of, that artists also use, but then uh, used in their corporate identity. And uh, the general signage uh, says like uh, childhood, exhibition, find your own way. So it's like uh, leaving a lot uh, of room for interpretation. And uh, please no toasters uh, also in the museum. That's not very welcome. And uh, this is the highest point of the museum. It says God. And uh, on the toilets, of course, it's free, you know, like, uh, so, uh, yeah, this is like the latest work. So it's, it's always good to show the latest work because I think also that as a creative, I mean, you're constantly evolving. You're not always making brilliant things, but often you are as good as your last work. I think uh, to, to uh, start a little bit with uh, two cases uh, that we did, I think it's sometimes very uh, good to embrace ideas that you think would never happen or are totally impossible. Uh, this happened also with uh, one of our first clients, which is uh, the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel. It's a this was actually the first client that ever called us, in, uh, or that called us uh, on, on uh, the first day that we opened, or in the first week. And uh, this was like a 500 bed budget hotel in the center of Amsterdam. And um, the next day I went there and I was yeah, really uh, surprised what I, what I saw there, because I had high expectations being it our first client. But the hotel really looked like a shithole. I mean, it was the <laughs> worst nightmare I ever had because I, I was so disappointed, uh, this being our first client. But then they said, like, okay, uh, our briefing is that we just, uh, I, don't want, we, I don't want any uh, complaints anymore, said the manager of the hotel. For the rest, uh, you, you do what you like. And um, I mean, we thought, like, what do we have to make about this? Because it's like difficult to, to not lie in this hotel uh, when you make advertising for them. But then the, uh, it turned out, the, uh, that was our idea or the strategy, that uh, maybe um, honesty is their only luxury. So that is something that we used all the way through uh, the campaign. <laughs> so it says like now a bed in every room, uh, now even more rooms without a window, uh, now a door in every room, uh, or now even more dog shit in the main entrance, <laughs> which is quite uh, normal in Amsterdam. And uh, we did this also for real in the central station. <laughs> just uh, put flags into the dog shit and uh, just saying like uh, you find more of this at our main entrance and uh, only this uh, image and this very cheap action in a way in both in a lot of ways uh, brought the hotel a lot of uh, publicity because there was an Amsterdam hotel that advertised itself in shit and uh, we did all the, also these things we did in the hotel itself because it's quite disappointing when you check into the uh, room so there was this uh, with compliments card uh, on the bed and uh, when you had like uh, scissors with you, you could cut out all these luxuries and just uh, put them in the hotel room and uh, so... Uh, I mean, the, a year later we saw that everything was going already quite well and uh, they had more uh, overnights. We thought it's, make, uh, it's good to make a very... Uh, expensive ad. So, uh, I borrowed this uh, from a five-star uh, hotel, uh, this image. Just put a lot of stars on it and it uh, said, like, not included. So uh, this is the film that goes with it. Yeah, another year we thought it's maybe nice to show also really the people that uh, visit the hotel. So we used this classical advertising trick of before and after. We only turned it around, so it says like check in, hands bring a budget hotel, check out. <laughs> and uh, like, uh, so the city of Amsterdam was not very happy with this, but uh, it brought a lot of success for the hotel. 
This was like a moment when we thought like maybe this is almost the end of it because we, how far can we go with this? And sometimes you, that thought it's maybe nice to keep that for, to use that for another, for the next campaign. So we said like uh, Hans Brink, a budget hotel, it can't get any worse, uh, but we'll do our best. There's many things in a hotel where they can give a little bit of a suggestion how uh, the, uh, I mean also here there are four rooms in the hotel that have this view. So it's better to close the curtains to avoid any disappointment. And even this one, I, I mean, the image on the right is more promising than the image on the left. Hans Brinker Budget Hotel, Amsterdam. It can't get any worse. But we'll do our best. Yeah, I think uh, there was a moment uh, that there were also these boutique and design hotels popping up around the Hans Brink Hotel. So we said like, okay, we also maybe have unique design. And then uh, suddenly, after many years, there was suddenly something that was very positive about the hotel, because we found out that the hotel was accidentally eco-friendly, <laughs> because there is an eco towel in the room, as you see here, and, uh, which is the curtain. And uh, there's also an eco elevator, and there's an eco shower in there. And uh, often when you look for these ideas, uh, they are closer, than, they're closer by than you think, because uh, in this case, uh, the inspiration came from the hotel sign itself, because for many years only the L was burning of the hotel sign. So this is like a newspaper that we made with all the eco stuff in the hotel, and uh, on the back of the newspaper uh, there was this eco fact saying like, oh, hotel sign only uses 20% of the energy of normal hotel signs. <laughs> This just shows that you don't have to think often too hard. It's just uh, on the street, uh, the idea. Uh, nowadays, uh, yeah, we made also recently, uh, like we made a book, uh, call it uh, The Worst Hotel in the World. And the funny thing is that nowadays the hotel has, uh, it came from 60,000 overnights. Maybe, it, I mean, the hotel hasn't changed. It looks maybe even worse than when I first came in there. But now they have more than 150,000 overnights. But the one task we didn't really reach because, uh, I mean, they get, still have complaints. But now on, on, uh, on, on TripAdvisor, people often complain that they, that they have been there, but they didn't think it was bad enough. So that was, uh, that's quite uh, disappointing. And funny enough, now also a second worst hotel of the world is opening because they opened a hotel in, uh, in Lisbon. And uh, so we, have the, we made the, their, their website and then uh, it shows also how they think about big groups and uh, that you, uh, what, what is all on the menu, everything is on the menu and also on one plate and uh, how to come prepared. And we positioned the hotel exactly the same, but it's the same hotel, but lots of new complaints or uh, same dubious service, uh, slightly better weather. And um, this is like a short uh, film for the Lisbon uh, uh, branch. Hans Brinker, Lisbon. Sit back and relax at our idyllic oasis. Yeah, then uh, a totally uh, different hotel that we worked for also from the beginning. It's called Citizen M. And uh, here we did also the name and everything uh, in and around the hotel, uh, communication-wise. So Citizen M means uh, mobile citizen. And this is like a container hotel which, uh, which started on the airport in Amsterdam and now they're in many uh, countries. So it, the hotel combines budget and luxury and it's kind of affordable luxury for the people. And um, so you, in the hotel you don't have to, uh, there's no line for checking in because you have to do it yourself. And uh, the, in the hotel you have a lot of uh, like this population of mobile citizens and we use them uh, on all the materials of the, of the hotel. Also here, uh, here's a bag uh, combining budget and luxury in one bag. 
And uh, we also did the, the shampoo with Citizen AM and a Citizen PM. Or also on the soap, it says, uh, designed to turn even the longest haul traveler into a sparkling, clean, and nice smelling human being again. And the uh, funniest job, funniest briefing for this hotel was that we also could come up with the uh, wake up call. That's this one. 199, 98, 97, 96. Takes a long time, this. 95, uh, 94. Yeah, I'll stop it here. Also, the advertising, this was the, when they opened the hotel in London. Choose a hotel that's 400 meters away from here, uh, from here and a million miles from the Hilton. And recently, they opened in, uh, on Times Square in New York, a uh, hotel. Uh, it says, like, luxury uh, is free Wi-Fi and extra large bed, not a stupidly long car. And we had also this guy walking around the Hilton Hotel saying, a 24-hour bar and free Wi-Fi beats a guy in a silly hat carrying your bags. And then uh, we did the following film we did to pr promote also the branch in, uh, in, on Times Square. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, nowadays uh, you see also a lot of students who in the art school already did many, many uh, or different uh, departments for they even before they even graduate. I think now is also the time uh, for creative people to cross over with a lot of disciplines. It's much more open than it used to be, so that, that's always a very good uh, challenge. I like to do these uh, things as well, so you can when you have a strong idea, I think ideas and strong ideas are also the future for design and for every creative discipline because, I mean, all the technology we have, it's, we can make anything uh, that we like to make, but what do, we, what do we make in the end? I mean, that's the question, so you need a very good idea for that. And uh, this is an idea we did for um, a Red Stripe uh, beer where we uh, transformed uh, like a corner shop in London for one night uh, with all these rigs behind the products in the, in the corner shop. So when you grab the Red Stripe beer, suddenly every, everything started to move uh, manually and uh, on, on, on pressure, air pressure. So it, it was quite a funny effect. Yeah, and another uh, um, project was uh, in a way very small, and there it's sometimes it's good when, when you have a very small brief, you can even, even make it bigger by trying to, uh, to, to 
connect another medium with it. I, I was asked to uh, design a stamp for the Dutch uh, post office. The, the idea was uh, that I found out that uh, you have also nowadays these uh, lenticular material. You know this from the postcards that are slowly moving then. But nowadays there are 30 frames of uh, images in there. So you have a little bit of a film, which means that you have a little bit of a film of over one second. Uh, and um, so I thought it's nice to position this stamp as the, the smallest and shortest film ever. And uh, this film was then, uh, I asked Anton Cobain, a Dutch uh, filmmaker uh, and, and a photographer, to make this stamp and to, to make the film. And this was the result. So he took a famous uh, Dutch actress and uh, he made like a classical Dutch uh, stamp. But then uh, it was nice because there, soon there was the Dutch Film Festival. So I thought like uh, maybe it's nice to, uh, it wasn't like an audience like this where people were invited to uh, come and see uh, Anton Cobain's uh, latest short film. And uh, they uh, were all coming in tuxedo and uh, so the, space, the, the, the total the auditorium was full. And then the, uh, we showed this, uh, this little film. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody was totally pissed off uh, because they had to leave the auditorium again and uh, I mean they didn't like the, the humor of it but at the end uh, they got like a little uh, folder with a, with a stamp in it and uh, signed by Cobain so the, they could uh, after half, a, half an hour everybody could get the, the, the humor of it. Uh, another. Uh, Thing is that uh, I was asked by uh, with a group of other people for, by a museum to uh, come up to bring uh, visitors of the museum closer and more involved with the with the uh, artworks in that museum because it turns out that on average uh, people look uh, nine seconds at an artwork uh, in museum all over the world, but then I found out that uh, in sports school uh, when people run on a treadmill on average they look about 20 minutes to a soap uh, on the television. So uh, this was combined in, in that museum. There was like a digital counter above the work. This is like a very uh, famous uh, Willem de Kooning uh, uh, painting. And then above the painting, it shows like how many minutes you would run for this. And there were in total like 16 works of art where people in the museum could get fit and then uh, look at the, at the works. This was a, kind of a painful thing because in 2002, everybody in Holland knows this because uh, Holland didn't qualify for the World Cup of soccer. Uh, even, there were even, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there was somebody in the office uh, looking at the FIFA ranking, the world ranking, and Holland was on the ninth place, but not even qualifying. So then uh, you can scroll down and uh, we found out that uh, on the bottom of the ranking, there are two teams, uh, Bhutan and Montserrat, and these two teams, they uh, actually never won a game. And there are two under two and two under three. Bhutan and Montserrat, which Montserrat is a, vul a volcanic island, this is their national uh, football pitch in, uh, in Montserrat, so it makes no sense to, uh, to play the game here. And uh, Bhutan also didn't have a very good reputation because I showed just one match that they did recently before, uh, before this, which was this we one. We played against uh, Kuwait uh, for the first time, I should say, international game. And then it was quite a bitter experience. So they played against Saudi Arabia, an away game, always difficult. Yeah, that was... Uh, so they were totally frustrated as well. So uh, the idea was to let... Uh, the idea we had to let these two lowest qualified teams play against each other in a match. But then exactly at the same time as the final in uh, Tokyo between uh, at that moment. So the game was played in Bhutan. It was called the other final. And we also shot a documentary there. 
And uh, this is the Bhutanese team, and this is the uh, Montserrat team. I mean, when you look at the team pictures, you already see who won and who lost. <laughs> of course, uh, Montserrat lost. I mean, it was a fantastic game. There were 25,000 spectators, a very bad game. I mean, uh, even uh, the worst amateur game you see in Europe is even better than this one. But it was fantastic because uh, it was uh, like a celebration of the sport and also for these uh, countries because there was one winner and at least they uh, won a game then. You can see the documentary, I think, also online. It's called The, the Other Final. We also designed the cup. Uh, everybody got a half of it. <laughs> and, uh... But then the result was that uh, Bhutan moved to a place uh, 199. Yes, that was good. Yeah, now a little uh, intersection. Uh, I think uh, mistakes, as I said in the beginning, it's very good to uh, embrace mistakes because uh, I, I find uh, always a lot of uh, inspiration in them. I recently also, uh, in April, there's a book uh, full of mistakes uh, that I made uh, coming out from Faden. It's called Failed It. And uh, there's a lot of inspiration in there that I find uh, in other people's work and in my own work that is, uh, that, that is made by, by kind of failure. Uh, but inspiration is often by construction mistakes that I find on, uh, online. So I collect all these construction mistakes that are very nice, you know, like, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's very stupid, but uh, I mean, uh, even this, it's a billboard, but uh, I think this billboard is more effective than it would be when it would be the other way around. So. I mean, I think people look at this instead of uh, when it would be the other way around. Uh, also here, like, uh, I mean, there's uh, all kinds of uh, things that you can get inspired by. I mean, how, in, how the hell can you park here? And uh, yeah, here's also something going wrong. <clears throat> Little uh, painful for your children. This was, uh, the next one was recently photographed on a graveyard in Amsterdam. That's this one. It's like a garbage uh, thing next to a grave. Very painful as well. Very confrontational. And uh, yeah, like... Uh, it goes on and on, and you, you can find these anywhere, these things. Uh. And then there's also, of course, the topic of the toilet, which I really like. So there's a lot of pictures of toilet where something went wrong, you know, like... Uh, I don't know how this is working, but... Uh, I mean, also here, privacy is an issue. I mean, uh, how can you be, I mean, here, another privacy issue. I mean, uh, how the hell does this work? And then this one is a disabled toilet. I mean, it's really like, uh, how can you, I mean, the question is if you go in disabled or if you come out disabled. I mean, it's, uh, it's so uh, painful, this, I mean. Uh, and then I think the uh, next one is my favorite. It's, oh, no, no, this is another one. Uh, it's a little smart solution and, uh, to open the door. And uh, another mistake here. And then uh, this is my favorite one because uh, you can combine a lot of things in this uh, image. You know, you can wash your hands, wash your dick, uh, take a piss. Uh, you can do anything. And uh, I mean, it's multifunctional, uh, fantastic. Yeah, that's uh, about uh, failures, but uh, have fun with it, I would say. And then the last uh, part of this presentation is uh, really like uh, about using your hobby. I think uh, strange with a lot of people have a hobby and they put a lot of passion in their hobby, but why not combine it in your work, especially when you're creative, because it's possible to combine that. I mean, I do that often uh, with uh, found photography, with images that I find, because this came from the fact that in advertising you see a lot of perfect images, so I try to, uh, I, f I find a lot of inspiration in amateur photographs and especially uh, family albums. So I made this exhibition as a tribute to the family album, which is not existing anymore. And uh, this was in Amsterdam. And uh, there's a lot of funny things that you can find in family albums. For instance, uh, when people uh, take photographs, the, 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 the most excessive moment is when they take photographs of their children, of the first child. I mean, they go really crazy. They make one or two albums about it. And you can find that everywhere uh, all over the world. I mean, that they, they fill an album with their first uh, child. I mean, when people can't have a child, they do the same thing with dogs. They uh, fill a whole album with dogs. And uh, I mean, this is a French album of two French people that have an enormous amount of dogs and they photograph them constantly. When you can't have children and you don't like dogs, then you make an album about your car, which is also uh, interesting. 
And albums are normally very boring. Here is somebody uh, photographing his house, house without anybody in there. Or uh, this is somebody visiting the flower garden, very boring. A couple that went to Benidorm on holiday. After three days, they were bored to death and uh, they take pictures of each other, looking miserable, and then filling up an album like that. And uh, here a woman with a blue umbrella. He uh, photographs her constantly with that blue umbrella. And also some more private albums you find. And, uh, uh, um, and then uh, people are very creative in albums. I mean, they stick pictures together that are nice. Uh, also, uh, you find like uh, little mistakes in the film or uh, splatters on the film or on the, on the prints. Very beautiful often. Uh, here is an ink stain on two images. Quite beautiful. And uh, cracks in the images, uh, overexposed images. And then there's, of course, the classic camera strap in front of the lens. And often you see that the whole uh, roll of 24 photographs are constantly with this strap in front of the... So it's really uh, funny. And then there is, of course, people that are excluded from the albums. So uh, brutally cut out of the image and stuck again back into the album. Uh, family members that are not, are not welcome anymore. And uh, people cut them brutally out, and uh, it's very, uh, very funny. I think this one, the next one is my favorite. It's like a woman who divorced, and she cut herself uh, out of the wedding picture, but the arm of her husband is still on there. But she stuck it on a new piece of paper and then stuck it back into an album again. Um, I mean, this is uh, something also that I recently did. Uh, it's a very personal project. It's called Unfinished Father. Uh, my father, he had a stroke uh, two years ago, and uh, before that, I mean, now he can't uh, speak or move anymore, but before that, he was restoring Fiat Topolinos, and the last one, the fifth one, he uh, can't finish that anymore. So he took a lot of pictures, when he, when he was still able to, uh, of how he restored uh, the car, and uh, like uh, progression of, how, of the restoration. And I found these pictures in his albums, and uh, very beautiful. I mean, he, uh, here he's restoring the wheel, fetching it with wood, and then uh, constantly taking pictures of how, how this is uh, progressing. So I made an exhibition with this called Unfinished Father. This is in Italy. Uh, it looks like a miniature, but it's actually a very big space. Just showing uh, like the car and also the pictures of my father as a tribute to uh, him and his work. I mean, I could use also my own work in that because yeah, I really like to reappropriate uh, re uh, existing images. I mean, this is then the, the, the idea of it that with this work, like my relationship with my father, uh, this car will remain forever unfinished. Another uh, exhibition I did was called 24 Hours of Photos. I downloaded about 24 hours of photos from uh, internet, from Flickr, and uh, it turned out in 24 hours all the newly uploaded images were 950,000. And then I printed them all and uh, threw them into a gallery and people could really walk through them and pick them up. And it shows also how private and public is really blurring nowadays. This was in a church in uh, the same uh, project in a church in Switzerland. Similar project also with selfies. I mean, uh, when you Google, I'm bored, uh, people, you see a lot of people p taking pictures of their feet and of their shoes because they're bored. And I used them, reused them again in a gallery and also on a skateboard ramp here. And it shows what you can do with uh, this. Talking about selfies, I come to the next thing because uh, we make a magazine called uh, Useful Photography. And nowadays you find so many selfies online, but you also find selfies where men compare their uh, genitals with an object. On Tinder and on uh, gay websites, you find a lot of uh, man holding their dick with something next to it and taking a picture. I mean, but there are so many of them, we found 8,000 of them. There are so many that, you can, that we edited the book uh, over the course of a day, you know, like all kinds of things that you do, do during a day, but then these things were always next to a uh, dick. And these images are all from different uh, uh, people. So, for instance, in the morning you... Uh... Sorry, I have to show this, sorry. In the morning, you uh, uh, wake up, you have a shower, and then you uh, shave yourself, and uh, you uh, use some deodorant, and uh, you brush your hair, and uh, you take an egg, or, like, uh, and then you uh, brush your teeth, and uh, you uh, use some toothpaste. Then you uh, leave the door, because you... Uh, 
you have to go to work, you step into the car, put a CD on, and uh, finally coming to work, you uh, switch on your computer, and uh, PC or Mac. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of uh, photographs. I mean, then you have lunch, have a little cigarette break in between, I mean, uh, use your pen, uh, and then you spend some money for the, for the dinner you have to buy. I mean, there are so many coins on digs, you won't believe that the first is only one, but the biggest we found is 28 coins on, uh, on uh, the genitals. Then you, there's more money next to it, there's a little uh, break, there's uh, some Coca-Cola next to it, you have to go to the toilet. And also, then you prepare dinner. Uh, you uh, play some music because it's after dinner and then uh, you uh, switch on the television and then you have a beer. I mean, there are so many beer cans that this in the book is just uh, alphabetically ordered from A to Z. So it's Astra, Bex, Carlin, uh, so it's like unbelievable. Uh, and then it's slowly getting towards the end of the, of the day. You have some sex, of course, then, yeah, then, uh, yeah, slowly. You go to bed and use the teddy bear. Okay, that was it. That was uh, the. Uh, oh yeah, and then you switch off the light. So that's uh, the end of it. Uh, yeah, I uh, go on to the next thing quickly. We we publish a lot of these books ourselves because, like you can imagine, with the dick book that nobody else wants to publish that. So we do it ourselves. And uh, the last thing I want to show today is the, like a series of books that I made. Is called that I make. They are called like uh, in almost every picture. And these are all uh, found photographs from amateurs, but then photographs where people really make a long-lasting series of these things, uh, just telling a story with this. The first one I found were, were 400 pictures of these of this woman going on holiday, and uh, the husband took pictures of her for 12 days, of 12 years. I mean, and uh, you see her over the years uh, very prominently uh, in the image. And I uh, kind of uh, found these images, selected them, and also put them in order of time. And what you saw is that uh, the more and more he photographed her, uh, funny enough, she got like uh, much smaller in the image. Uh, so, uh, so when you go through the book, I made this book out of it, it's almost like a flip book, and you see her shrinking in the image. So which means that maybe he lost some interest in its subject or he uh, maybe has more eye for the surrounding. But uh, because the, 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 the last picture in the book is, is she's uh, like very small. And uh, so I made the book. I also uh, uh, did an exhibition in Barcelona where I found these images and uh, I was asking if this woman was still alive. And uh, in the newspaper they're, they're called uh, Senora X or La Mujer Misteriosa. And uh, in the end, uh, somebody came to the gallery, it was an old colleague of her, a woman of 73 years old, and she said like, that she recognized the woman on the images uh, because she was called Josefina Iglesias, and uh, she died uh, some years before, and recently her husband died, and that's also why these images then ended up on a, on a market. Uh, similar uh, book, like in that series, uh, this, these are that uh, images that I found online, and uh, this was a Japanese amateur photographer that had a rabbit that can balance anything on his head. I mean, it's really... Uh, Every day he uploaded a new image on his uh, website and um, it got more and more ridiculous. Uh, very funny, uh, like, uh, and uh, Oolong was a great balancer. I mean, he, uh, but then uh, at a certain moment it went a bit wrong uh, because uh, this was one day I saw this and Oolong got sick and you could follow that also every day. And then one day it was like uh, this image. I thought this is the end of it, but the next day I couldn't resist to go to the site again, and uh, there was this image, which uh, in the end, uh, these are two carrots, uh, and uh, not, not his ears, but, uh, but it shows how uh, beautiful people can tell a story with uh, certain images. Similar in the same series, this is a woman uh, that I found out about that uh, shot when she was 16 years old in 1936. She shot images. Uh, on, her, uh, on a fun fair, and then when she hit the bullseye, they took a picture of her, and she did this like uh, for all her life, and uh, every year there was a new photograph, and you see the whole history of photography coming by, and it's a beautiful uh, series in that sense. I heard of this woman, went to her home, uh, showed her my other, other books, and asked if I could make a book uh, with the images, and she loved it, of course. I mean, here you see her uh, sitting with the book, 
This is uh, Ria now at the moment. She's uh, deep in her 90s, uh, still shooting every year. And I went with her to exhibitions, and she couldn't resist to take a gun also to... Uh, <laughs> even when we went abroad, uh, this was a plastic gun, but I had to tell uh, always at customs that this was like a, a fun thing for her, and I showed the book. And uh, so here she's trying to shoot me uh, in the... Uh, this is one book I made, uh, which is maybe the most kind of uh, mysterious uh, thing within photography, and the most uh, dramatic thing, because it's like, uh, uh, this is an album from people, and they puzzled all their life because they thought, like, how to shoot my black dog. And uh, these people struggled all their life to photograph their black dog, <laughs> and it was like a disaster, and, uh, one big failure, because they tried to, to do it very properly, and it went constantly wrong and constantly wrong. And, uh, I mean, they had also a black sofa, which doesn't really help. Even in bright sunlight, they fucked it up. How can you be so, I mean, very amateuristic? I mean, uh, the, the, the whole thing is like, a, like a, a black cutout in the images. But then there was, in that family album, there was one image where probably they got so frustrated that they uh, uh, started to overexpose the image. And that's the only one where, yes, here it's... Finally, they made it, but they totally overexposed it. And uh, so, okay, now the final thing, and it's maybe uh, time to get a little bit uh, wet now, because uh, I mean, uh, this is all about water. Ooh, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, and uh, yeah, this is maybe uh, this is maybe uh, an album which is uh, you can refer it almost to the first album that I showed of this uh, Spanish woman. Oh, you get, it's okay. It's okay. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the Spanish woman uh, was the similar, but here it's uh, two people that are still alive. They are from Florida. And this is Valerie on the image. And uh, the photographer is Fred. And, um, I mean, uh, Fred is very into photographing uh, uh, Valerie in the water. And at first it was like with her bathing suit, but then uh, Valerie had to keep the clothes on. And, uh, constantly the clothes on and she got a bit more wet with the clothes in the water and it got more and more bizarre because yeah like uh, I mean it's uh, absurd and uh, also at night they went to a public fountain and uh, you yeah, know I mean they photographed uh, Fred photographed Valerie in the, in, in the fountain and then uh, it's a bit uh, frisky uh, here when it was raining for them it was fantastic because they got like totally wet yeah, like uh, even they had like uh, also, of course, Fred was a fantastic photographer. They had a swimming pool. Also in the winter, they took pictures. I, so I made this book, and then uh, uh, I made the book. Uh, it's beautiful images. It's kind of an Ophelia, modern style Ophelia. So I made the book uh, uh, and I printed it on plastic paper, but I didn't tell them. And I asked Fred, "Listen, I sent you this book." can you please take a picture with Valerie in the water of this book? Because I would love that, to use that for publicity. And then uh, uh, he sent me this uh, email. He said, hello, Eric. I've sent a dozen of photos from our afternoon book swim. I hope they uh, meet what is needed for publicity photos. I have Photoshop touched them up for good presentations. I shot well over 100 views. These are the best. Uh, the shoot went well. We were both in the mood. Uh, there was a light overcast, as hoped for, with no harsh shadows. Valerie wanted to know if the book was really to go into the water. I said yes. So after the photo sequence, we both uh, swam with the book, uh, looking again at each picture. The water was not seeming to have any effect on it. We must have enjoyed two hours in the water with it. I rinsed it off in the house, dried off each page, placed paper towels between each page. Uh, the book seems to have withstood the lengthy adventure just fine. Love the business, Fred and Valerie. And then these were the images that they uh, took. And this was the best one, I think. Uh, but then I thought, like, this uh, whole story is ending now. But then uh, they uh, invited me to exhibit the photographs. And uh, this was in Switzerland. The people were also invited. Uh, Fred and Valerie was invited to that festival. They couldn't come because they had another shoot going on. <clears throat> and then uh, Valerie was a lot... Uh, you saw Valerie everywhere in the town, and uh, even in the fountain was made. Yeah, and then I thought, like, uh, this is really over. But then suddenly, uh, recently, I found, like, uh, this image online. And uh, it turned out that Stella McCarthy, this fashion company, totally ripped off the cover of the book. So, uh, I mean, it's uh, scandalous, I think. Uh, 
But then uh, I sent this to uh, Fred and Valerie, and I thought, like, uh, and now it comes. I mean, uh, it, uh, I thought, like, maybe uh, they're so pissed off, they're going to take uh, court actions. And then uh, Fred uh, sent me this email. He said, like, we see the Stella photos. She does look a bit starched, not enjoying the adventure. <laughs> sort of makes one wonder why she would be doing it to start with. <laughs> I would hope she would get satisfaction in eventually taking the whole outfit under. <laughs> Thank you. Fuck, you know. <laughs>